Transmitter device activated. Coordinates set for Earth 2. Hey everyone, welcome to the Earth 2 podcast, the podcast where we explore the origins and the development of the DC Comics multiverse and the legacy of their Golden Age characters throughout the Silver and the Bronze Ages of comics. I'm Peter Watson. And I'm David Steele. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us. We're still in the early part of 1968, listeners. This week we're doing the final Silver Age team-up between the Atoms of Earth 1 and Earth 2. All the Silver Age Earth 1 and Earth 2 team-ups are starting to wind up at this point. Yeah. I think we've pretty much had the last Flash one, haven't we? I think so, yeah. Huh? It's ages till there's another Jane Barry mm-hmm. sharing story. As the crow flies, the, the final Hal Jordan and Alan Scott Silver Age team-up is, isn't too far away. But as I say, today we're doing issue 36 of The Atom, which was published on the 1st of February 1968, the, the second and final Atom team-up of The Silver Age. And I don't think they actually have a team-up proper just to do them ever again. No, they, there's a, a crossover of power story, but that's that's the only thing. Yeah, yeah. aye. Whatever happened to yeah. The Atom and then there's a story, yeah. The Golden Age Atom DC Comics presents, that's right. We'll be doing those, obviously. Yep. Mm-hmm. So yes, Pete C, do you want to tell everyone about the cover to issue 36 of The Atom? I'd love to. I don't know about you, but my copy is damaged because uh, Ray Palmer Atom is punching Al Pratt <laughs> Atom through the actual cover towards me. Mm. Gosh, how dare he? Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> it's a brilliant cover. It's Gil Kane, obviously. Yep. I'm a big fan of that sort of cover. Mm-hmm. You know, pretend cover damage is incredibly dynamic. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I remember a Fantastic Four one with Doctor Doom's gloves sort of scratching. Yeah. A cover or something. I remember That's that true. one in the 80s. Sometimes when they do this, the actual cover image is actually the splash page behind. But in this case, it's not. It's just kind of representative panels of the story. It's not actually anything yeah. specifically from the story. Yeah. Which, which is a bit disappointing. You know, sometimes you know they do that and it's, it's epic. But yeah, I mean, it would have been nice to have the, the splash page underneath, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Maybe the cover was done first or Indeed. the splash page wasn't ready. Uber dynamic as Al Pratt and his bright yellow and blue sort of goes flying forward at the front. A massive big burst of force where Ray Palmer has connected with Al. And look at those Gil Kane style abs. I always talk about the abs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the detailing on Al's face as well as he falls back. Gil yeah. is definitely evolving at this mm-hmm. point. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, it's got the, the Atom logo at the top mm-hmm. and uh, the Atom in his atomic shrinking symbol in the top left-hand corner as well, just above the DC logo. And it says, beside that, the world's smallest superhero. And in the bottom left-hand corner, we have the title, which says, Jewel Between the Jewel Atoms. Well, that's a nice, funny play on words. It is. That's mm-hmm. Gardner Fox giving us some lessons there. Yeah. <laughs> Ray Palmer has a bit of dynamic speech as he punches his illustrious predecessor. He does indeed. He says, This magazine isn't big enough for two atoms. Gosh, that's another nice play on, because they're both small. Yes. That's hilarious. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe he should be saying, This magazine isn't small enough for two atoms. That might be fun. Yeah. Indeed. Well, so yes, Pete says there's a few sort of panels in the background. There's one that obviously indicates Ray doing his shrinking and there's one of Ray punching out Al. And it seems that Ray's saying the bigger they are, the harder they fall. There's a couple of other ones, one of which we're not going to describe because it actually spoils part of the story. Yes. But not it's a cracker. It's definitely one of the most iconic. Mm-hmm. You know, of the two Atom ones, I think it's more iconic. Oh, than, yes. Than the than, Thinker one. Than yeah. the other one of the Thinker. Mm-hmm. And in its own ways, it's just as iconic as Flash 1, 2, 3 and Green Lantern 40, I suppose. Yep. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's probably enough about the cover, shall we? Let's jump in, yes. The splash page is also very dynamic and also quite similar because it's almost as if it's the same image but from yeah. a different angle. Yeah, it's Al Pratt, Golden Age Atom is falling backwards away from us in this image. You know, it's almost like a flip of the cover. The same concussive force as Earth One Ray Palmer Atom punches up in the background. There's a giant, this is incredibly guilty, there's a giant screaming Ray Palmer face head type thing. People always used to say, like, you know, but Gil Kane, it's 25 pages of looking up someone's nose, and <laughs> that's what we've got straight away. Yeah. By Ray Palmer's nostrils. Fine set of teeth he's got there. So mm-hmm. with the Atom logo, a little caption box saying, story by Gardner Fox, art by Gil Kane and Sid Green. And there's a little text box at the bottom of the page, and it says, Two human atoms exploding into combat. Two firm friends turned into furious foes. An atomic fallout threatening two Earths. Now that you've been turned on for... Jewel Between, between the, the Jewel Atoms. atoms. And then there's a small scroll that says, Read on. Terrific. So, let's jump straight into the story. The first caption for the first panel on page two says, 
To most wives, the sight of an eligible young bachelor is like a bull staring at a red flag. Matchmaker Betty Roberts is no exception as she eyes Professor Al Atom Pratt of Calvin College. And we see Al Pratt in his short sleeves with his tie undone, loose at the collar. And he's with a couple of friends who actually look very much like Barry and Iris. They do, yes. Guy's hair's a little darker than Barry's, but he wears the same sort of jacket that I've seen Barry in many times. And mm-hmm. He does immaculately coiffured hair and a little necklace. They're haranguing him, basically. <laughs> Betty, for she, Betty Roberts, is saying, Al, my friend Marion Thayer is a real heart thumper. She's pretty as a rose in bloom, as brainy as an Einstein. And her husband Jim concludes, and Rich is closest too. So grab your jacket and come out on a double date with us old married folks. True to the mating game, Al is naturally more than somewhat suspicious. Al looks very sceptical. Gil Kane's facial expressions are a wonder here. They really are. He's a master. Al looks very sceptical. He looks like the guy from the cat from outer space. I can't remember his <laughs> name. Yes, he does. Uh-huh. That's obviously who's going to play Al Pratt when they, they make mm-hmm. the live action JLA just to say. Is he movie. five foot two? If he was five foot two, you know, that way. I can't remember his name. We should find that out and we'll, we, yeah, we'll all find out at some point anyway. So Al looks kind of sceptical. He's laughing with, with an atom here and he says, pretty, brainy. And Rich? Sounds too good to be true. So, what's wrong with her? Jim replies, Not a thing. She's everything Betty said she was, and then some. You men, you must think you're the greatest thing nature ever created. I've never seen anybody so suspicious. Al's put his jacket on in the next panel, straightening his tie, and he says, Then why is she still in circulation? Let's just say she hasn't met the right man yet. She may be fussy. Just like you. Okay, slow dissolve. Al's in his car, driving up to a big house. The caption says, At the Thayer Mansion in the swanky Claxon Woods section of Calvin City. Betty and Jim are obviously in the back of the car. We hear Betty's voice saying, Wait till you open the front door and see her, Al. I guarantee sparks will fly between you. This better not be a put-on, replies the diminutive dating adventurer. So, the caption for the next panel says, his heart thumping excitedly, Al presses the doorbell. And does so, he's thinking. Maybe this is the one. I've been so busy as the Adam in the past, I've sort of let romance pass me by. But if Maid Marian is only half as pretty as, and then the door opens, and, well, we see a lady who, to be fair, she looks, does look a bit glam, but, you know, her hair's kind of grey. There's obvious lines on her forehead, deep lines under her eyes. Her face is maybe starting to sag a little. And she says to Al, Hi, you must be Al Pratt. I'm Marion Thayer. What, what, why are you staring at me like that? Is something wrong? Top of the next page in the first panel, she continues. Is my makeup running? Al looks incredulous and he thinks, How could Betty and Jim do this to me? She's 50 years old if she's a day. So Al's obviously not into the cougars. No. Caption for the next panel. As a puzzled Marion Thayer turns and sees her reflection in the hall mirror... Yes, she looks appalled. Eh, what's happened to me? And Al leans forward thinking, Huh? She seems as surprised as I was at how she looks. She's going to faint. And then in the next panel, there's a scream. Ah! And we see Jim, and he's holding an older lady as well. In the background of this panel, we can see Al Pratt. He's caught Marion, who's fallen, and Al is thinking... Another scream, this time from Betty, and she looks just as old as Marion does. I know how young Betty was, so Marion must have been just as young looking. What could have made them age so fast? Caption for the next panel. The Calvin College prof whirls as his keen ears pick up. Yes, there's a sound effect, and indeed Al's head does whirl around as he reacts to the sound, and he thinks, someone in the back room there, using what sounds like an electrical device. It could be a coincidence. Or the answer to the mystery. He says out loud, i better check it out. As the Atom. Caption for the next panel. Placing the unconscious Marion on a couch, Al switches to his Atom uniform and... He must have a button or something. (laughs) Like he has in his car. Yeah. You know, it moves very quickly here. Mm -hmm. Um, So this final panel of page three shows the now costumed Al coming through a doorway in the foreground of the panel. There are some goons at work with some fancy looking ray guns. The Atom thinks... Men with odd science gadgets, ray blasting the wall safe. All right, let's see whether that ties in with the old gals. One of these goons that we can see is sort of brown suit, receding hairlines, another guy. 
in one of those horrible green check jackets that are so popular in these comics at this point. <laughs> Arriving at the top of page four, the caption for the first panel says, The tiny titan of Earth 2 is only five feet two inches tall, but he's strong as a bull and quick on his feet as a hungry panther. Yeah, and he rushes forward. We can see there's three goons. There's one a sort of brown suit, one in a kind of orange suit, and the aforementioned green jackety guy. The guy in the orange suit says, Adam! And the plaid jacketed guy says, He'd the last one we expected to find here. As Atom rushes forward, he's thinking, Got to get my hands on one of those beam throwers. Must say that panel, uh, the Atom's bottom <laughs> is protruding quite yes. massively there. It's that, um... it's that weird sort of emphasis that Gil Kane gives to odd parts of the anatomy yeah. at strange times. It's all bums and nostrils when <laughs> Gil Something Kane's... to the ladies there. Yes. It's all right. bums and nostrils when Gil Kane's in town. So the caption for panel two, page four, says, he is a missile with a brain, as... And Al leaps up into the air and sort of somersaults, thinking they expected a headlong attack. And he lands in the next panel with an oomph sound effect, taking out a couple of the baddies, and he continues to think, so I'll trip them up with some surprising footwork. Caption for the next panel. Using the falling thugs as launching pads, he flings himself forward. Yep, we see him bouncing off the, the green plaid jacketed hood. With a zoop sound effect, he punches out one of the other bad guys who looks incredibly guilty. And look how his hand stretches mm, up towards yes. the, the camera, and look how Al's body is sort of distorted. As Al punches out the suited goon, he says, Blasted the would be blaster. Try to say that five times fast. Top of page five now, the caption of the first panel. Staggered but not out, the safecracker strikes back. Safecracker swipes at Al with his gun, sending him flying, saying, You're too close to fry, so I'll use my thermal beamer to cool you off. Next panel, Al falls backwards onto a desk. The suited goon says, Now that I've got you set up, Adam. He continues in the next panel, pointing his gun down at the Atom, saying, How'd you like to get it? Rare, medium, or well done? Well done suits me, cries the Atom. Caption for the next panel. Gripping the table edges, the mighty might's legs lash out at the weapon wielder. Yeah, Al kicks up, knocks the gun out of the baddie's hand. The baddie goes flying with a burst of concussive force, and Al says, Meaning, well done on my part to cut you down. Again, the perspective of the anatomy is very odd here. Mm -hmm. Al's legs look very strange. As do the baddies. Nice shoe and sock detailing, though. Anyway, we're probably mm -hmm. too picky. It's very, all very dynamic, very action-packed. And the first panel, page six, the atom's up on his feet and punches the sooty bad guy, sending him flying into what looks like a bookcase. There's a bit of concussive force he collides because some books go flying, falling down on top of him. And the atom comments, There, that ought to drive some book sense into you. Okay, cool. Caption for the next panel. As the last would-be safecracker drops unconscious... The Atom picks up one of the guns and examines it, thinking, I'll hide this gadget, pick it up for examination in my Calvin College lab. But first, to phone the police to come and pick up these crooks. Shortly... This panel shows Al Pratt back in his civilian gear, helping Marion along. Jim's at the foreground of the panel, consoling Betty. And as he helps Marion, Al is thinking, all three of them. So overwrought at what happened. They didn't notice my absence. And then Jim says, Al, this is terrible. What'll we do? And then Al replies, Take the girls to your place, Bill. They can console each other while I, uh, try to find out how this has happened. And that's a mistake because it was called Jim earlier on. So, that's so Al's obviously very shook up by this. <laughs> yeah, I think we all are. So, mm. caption for the next panel then says, For several hours, the nuclear physics professor works alone in his laboratory. Yes, we see Al standing over a bench with a gun in front of him, some other equipment behind, head in his hands, head bowed. Looks a little defeated, he's thinking. There goes that theory. This gadget couldn't possibly have had anything to do with aging the girls. I'd better get this over to the police. They'll need it for evidence. When he arrives at police headquarters... Yes, there's a nice older jolly desk sergeant. He's on the phone and he's saying, Yes, Mrs. Nostrand will look into it right away. <sighs> Another call from a woman in Claxon Woods complaining she's suddenly turned old. You see Al in the background of the panel, with a gun wrapped up under his arm. He's obviously heard a policeman and he thinks, What's this? Then Betty and Marion aren't the only ones who were affected. Top of page seven. Al's conversing with the policeman. The policeman says, Putting on weight I can understand, but putting on years? You better send the Scientific Detection Bureau out to Claxon Woods. Search for something emitting a special radiation. And then Al thinks to himself, but I'm going far afield. Tackle this case from a different angle. Then we get a close-up of Al, looking very Ralph Dibney, and he thinks, mm -hmm. The Atom's going to Earth-1, where people and events roughly parallel those in Earth-2. It may be that this aging process hasn't occurred there yet. Knowing what will happen, 
I can be in the alert for the cause. Or, if it's already happened, maybe Earth-1 has met this problem and has licked it. Well, that's an interesting thought. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be so easy if we could just think every time something bad happened, we could just nip over to a parallel earth and see how they dealt with it? Of course. Mm. So, a change of scenery now. Slow dissolve. The caption for the next panel says... At this moment in time, on Earth-1, in the weapons room of the Ivy Town Museum... And we see three suited and jagged goons. This guy in an orange suit, guy in a blue suit, guy in another checked plaid jacket. Ugh, horrendous. And the orange suited guy is saying, Freddy the fence will pay plenty for this jaw pistol. And his check pattern jacketed colleague is distracted suddenly and says, Huh? Coming over that pistol? The atom! In the foreground of the panel, in perfect silhouette, leaping over another fancy ornate pistol in the, the weapons room, well, it's the atom. And as he jumps, he says, I had a tip you hoods would be robbing this gun collection. Well, here's another tip for you, Adam. Stay out of our business and we'll put you out of business, says the Orange City goon as he brings the gun up with a click as if he tries to fire. The Atom thinks, Time for Operation Click. And with a couple of little click-click sound effects, we can see that Ray is activating his shrinking equipment for the caption the next panel says, Instantly, the Atom's eye shrinks out of sight. Brilliant. Two bad guys that have gone to try and swipe him with the pistols look perplexed. The guy in the blue suit says, Where'd he go? Where indeed. Top of page eight, caption for the first panel. Within arm's reach of one of the crooks, the tiny titan clicks back to his normal six-inch fighting size and, with a hard tug... <laughs> this is great. He grabs at the sleeve of the orange-suited goon and swings it round so that he punches out his pal, basically. So the blue-suited goon, who's just endured a twack sound effect exclaims, Hey, watch what you're doing! I, I don't even know how I'm doing this! It's a very dynamic page. Lots of fighting. Nice little overlap of the figure of the atom between each of the panels. It's very good. And there's some cracking up the nostril, gilky in action in panel 2 of page 8. As the atom thinks, I'll handle the next action direct. Punched out the first goon, and the guy in the blue suit says, It's the atom again! Baldy, lend us a hand! Poor <laughs> Baldy. Yes, Baldy's the guy in the check jacket. We haven't said so already. We see the Atom kicking back at the blue suit guy, sending him flying in the next panel. And as he does this, the Atom thinks, Danger, coming up fast in my starboard quarter. Yeah, because Baldy is lunging towards him, saying, I'll grab him, squeeze him to a pulp. But then the caption for the next panel, As clutching fingers reach for the Atom, he springs onto the middle digits. Yep, we see the Atom grabbing the guy's middle finger on the left hand. And as he does this, the Atom thinks, a firm grasp along with a 180 pound increase in weight. Over the page to page 9, Pal takes up the full length of the left hand side of the page. And as the Atom grabs poor Baldy by that finger and flips him, he finishes. Is enough to throw him for a loss. Amazing. <laughs> Caption for the next panel. The next moment, incredibly. Baldy lands in the foreground of the panel, and the Atom is thinking. Huh? Why am I fighting these men? I've never seen any of them before. And what am I doing in this tiny size? Uh oh Something's gone wrong here. Caption for the next panel. And just as incredibly, from the crook's point of view... Yeah, the bandies are all starting to sort of get to their feet. Baldy's at the foreground, and he's thinking, Hey, how did I get out of stir? Blue suit guy's thinking. What am I doing here? Orange suit guy, getting back up at the background of the panel. He's thinking, who are these guys? Close up of the atom in the next panel, and he thinks... Where'd I get this costume? Next panel, the bad guys are all starting to scarper. Baldy thinks, I better beat it before the prison guards catch up to me. Orange suit guy thinks, I promised to play poker with a gang tonight. Blue suit guy thinks, Maverick is on TV tonight and I won't miss that program for nothing. That's a good panel. I might stick that with an Instagram. So the final panel, page nine, the Atom is leaving the building and he's thinking, All I can be sure of is I'm Ray Palmer. A student at Ivy University, and I have a date tonight with that new girl on campus, Jean Loring. But how can I keep it in the shape I'm in? Bit of amnesia type stuff going on. Very, very interesting. Page 9 is rounded out with a caption that says, Continued in third page following. And over the page is a full page advertisement for The Flash 178, but we'll tell you about that next time. Top of page 10, the caption of the first panel says... Making himself as inconspicuous as possible, the tiny titan races to his rooming house, where... Yes, we see a tiny, tiny atom running along, and he's thinking... How am I ever going to reach up to that doorknob and open... Hey, the door's opening. Someone's coming out. 
someone wearing a mask in uniform too. Yeah, the person that's coming out wearing a mask in uniform is the Atom of Earth 2, who we've met already in this issue. It's Al Pratt. So panel 2, our perspective here is looking downwards towards the Earth 1 Atom, as we're slightly behind the Earth 2 Atom. The Earth 2 Atom says, So there you are, Adam. I've been looking for you. Listen, I vibrated into your Earth because I need your help. You talk as if you know me. Why'd you call me Atom when my name's Ray Palmer? Ray Palmer? The Atom? What's the difference? You're both the same per- Hey! Why am I explaining this to you? Because I've never heard of the Atom any more than I've ever seen you. Ray continues in close-up. Listen, bear with me for a while. All of a sudden I found myself in this small size, decked out in this costume, fighting guys I don't know. When the last thing I remember is starting to leave for a date. A sophomore Ray Palmer, a six-footer with Gene Loring, a freshman at Ivy Town U. The next panel, off to Atom leaning down, says... Sounds like your memory of the last ten years have been completely blotted out. Boy, have you a lot of catching up to do. To start, you're wearing a uniform made from dwarf star matter that's invisible and entangable when expanded. The size and weight controls are hidden in the palms of your gloves so that when pressed a certain way... Let me see a close-up here of the Earth 2. I'm looking at my own hand as I'm <laughs> describing this. <laughs> close-up of the Earth 2 atom pressing the little control disc in the palm of the Earth 1 atoms out of it. There's a little click sound effect, and as we turn to top of page 11, the Earth 2 Atom continues, you return to your Ray Palmer self. And we see Ray, fully restored, looking very bright, it must be said very youthful almost, mm-hmm. and he waves back to the Earth 2 Atom saying, Thanks pal, I'd like to listen to the rest of the story, but some other time. It took a long while to get that date with Gene Loring, and I'm not going to miss out on it. Panel 2 then shows Ray descending a flight of stairs, and he's saying, I don't remember buying this classy suit, but it'll do for the evening. As he watches him go, the Earth 2 Atom thinks, I can't let Ray run around not knowing what's happened to him the last ten years. And I thought I had problems back on my Earth. I wonder if there's any connection between both problems. The women ageing, Ray looking younger. Slow dissolve, caption for the next panel. Hurriedly buying a box of chocolates and a bouquet for that new girl on campus, Ray rings Jean's doorbell and... So the door opens, opened by a glamorous looking lady with her hair in colours, and Ray Palmer, who looks very Hal Jordan in these pages, it must be said. Yes. Ray Palmer says, Hi, beautiful. Oh, I must be early. You're still not dressed for our date. Ray, darling, you brought me candy and flowers. How sweet of you. Jean goes in for a kiss in the next panel. Ray looks very surprised and thinks, She, she called me darling and kissing me, and I thought I was a fast worker. Very Hal Jordan. Caption for the next panel. As Jean breaks her clinch... Yep, Jean breaks back, and she says, Ray, you look different, so much younger. And what's this about a date tonight? Of course, I'm always happy to see the man I'm engaged to marry, but... Marry? Aren't you rushing things, Miss Loring? <laughs> yeah, Ray looks appalled. Caption for the final panel, page 11, then says, From the shadows where Atom 2 has been a fascinated spectator... A fascinated spectator? What a creep! Jean says, Miss Loring, rushing things? Let me remind you, Ray Palmer, you're the one who kept proposing to me for years. If you're trying to wriggle out of our engagement... Or to Atom interject, saying, Listen, Miss Loring, Ray isn't himself. He has no recollection of the last ten years. He's living now as he did a decade ago. Top of page 12, Jean says, Oh, so that explains why he looks so much younger. Al Pratt, Earth 2 Atom, says, Let me handle this, Miss Loring. I'll help him. Ray tries to brush Al off, saying, So it's you again. Go away, will you? Continues the next panel. If anything's wrong here, it's with Miss Loring talking about marrying me before I've even had my first date with her. Easy, Ray, easy. I think I know how to bring you up to date, so let's go. And as they start to leave, Jean and her curlers says, My poor darling, caption for the next panel says, Then, before the lady lawyer's horrified eyes, There's a sort of burst of yellow energy, yellow light, and Jean exclaims, <gasps> They suddenly vanished out of sight. A tiny caption says, Story continues in second page following. The rest of this page is taken up with an advertisement of this showcase that debuts Anthro. And we'll meet Anthro, I think, eventually in the pages of Crisis and Infinite Earth. So that's something to look forward to. Yeah, I wish we could do an Anthro story, but, you know. I I think I had a couple of them at one point. I don't know if I've still got them. I've got them all. They're brilliant. Yeah, it would be fun, wouldn't it? It'd be fun to do everything, really. Okay, so, (laughs) over the page now. Past the letters page of this issue. Page 13 is a caption at the top that says... Duel Between between the the Dual Atoms, atoms, Part part 2. Okay, and a little text box says, Mere moments after activating his atomic vibrator, 
Atom returns to his own Earth with Ray Palmer. Yes, we see the Earth 2 Atom and the besuited Ray Palmer standing in a wooded area. The Atom's looking up at Ray and thinking, I've got a theory, wild as it is, that whatever caused women to age here will somehow counteract Ray's youth reversion. And he says, Don't ask questions, Ray. Just answer me. Now, how old are you? Twenty-eight. Do you have a secret identity? You know I do. I'm the Atom of Earth 1, just as you're the Atom on Earth 2. Now, before we actually go into the next panel, we should mention, there's a bit of Chekhov's gun going on here, because in the foreground of this panel is a bird box that's been set up in one of the trees in this wooded area. So, the Earth 2 Atom says, How do you become the Atom? The next panel, Ray continues. I click on the size and weight controls concealed in the gloves of my invisible when expanded uniform, like this. And he clicks, and we see the little whirl of the, the sort of atom effect around him. And it must be said that Ray does look a little bit more like he should do. Mm-hmm. You can see a sort of a few more lines in his face. He doesn't look quite as, as Jake Lambert as he did in the previous pages. As he activates his device, the Earth 2 atom observes, Swell! Now you're all set to deal with a perplexing problem to risen on both our Earths. But before I tell you about it, there's something else we have to solve. Why didn't I age backwards on your world the way you did? Now, the next panel, Ray Palmer has shrunk down into his atom costume. And he suddenly says, That's your problem, big boy, not mine. And with a zock, he punches the Earth 2 atom in the ankle. Gosh. The next panel, another bit of Gil Keane twisting perspective. We're sort of down on the ground looking up at Al Pratt's atom, who says, Adam, what's getting into you? Why pick on me? And Ray Palmer's atom bounces up towards him, saying, You're the only one here, and you make me fighting mad. So the page then, top page 14, and the next few pages are basically just a sort of fight, so we'll see how we get on. So Ray Atom punches Al Atom backwards and Al Atom thinks he's become antagonistic, aggressive. The forward aging effect working against the backward aging one must have stirred up a mental storm within him. Al Atom cries, Adam Ray, calm down, I don't want to fight you. Too bad for you, my feeling isn't mutual. Okay, but remember you forced me into this. And as Al Atom takes a swing, there's a click as Ray obviously shrinks further down. And Al thinks, ah, he clicked himself out of sight. But Ray Atom is back in the next panel, more visible, and again he punches Al backwards, knocking Al into a bird bath, breaking it in half. That's terrible. As he, this is all going on, Ray Atom says, That bath is for the birds, and so are you, Atom. <laughs> Ray Atom looks down at Al Atom from the branches of a tree, saying, Looking for me, Adam? I'm up here. Tell you what, I'll give you one free crack at me. Caption of the next panel. Stung by the hits and hoots of his one-time pal, the Earth 2 Atom lashes out at the taunting tiny titan. Ray Atom swings out the way, missing the powerful punch, and he says, You must be cracked if you thought I really meant that. Maybe I can sting some zing into you with this birdhouse. Yes, grabs the birdhouse that we saw on earlier page, throws it at the Golden Age Atom, and the Golden Age Atom ducks down, thinking, There's no hope of reasoning with him. I'll have to try to knock him out. Get him back to his own Earth, where things weren't as bad as they are here. Al Atom successfully managed to hurl the bird box back towards Ray Atom. With a crash, they collide. And Al Atom says, Caught him on the fly. Grabs a hold of his diminutive colleague, holds him in both hands, holds him up in the final panel of page 15 and says, Got you. Now I'm going to vibrate us both into Earth 1. You're not vibrating me anywhere. I like it here. <laughs> Over the page now, another bit of dynamic... Gil Kane panel action as the Golden Age Atom says, I hate to do this, Adam, but if you won't go voluntarily, pulls a fist back as if to punch him, and then with a thunk, Al Atom's hand collides with Ray Atom, and Al says, Now, to turn on my atomic vibrator and take off. Caption for the next panel. But, unknown to the Atom of Earth 2, just before impact, his wily foe clicked his size and weight controls, and... Yep, close-up shot of Al's hand here. There's a little bit of movement because Ray has shrunk down and is zipping away, thinking, Shrank small enough to squeeze between his fingers. Now to jam his vibrator. Caption name for the next panel. So that just as Atom 2 reaches for his atomic vibrator controls... Ah, that's a very interesting, very dynamic Gilkeen panel. It shows a little device that the Earth 2 Atom has concealed in his belt. Hmm. The buckle opens up and there's a dial and there's a switch. Yeah, there, it's fascinating. Yeah. No, add that to the list of ways of crossing between the mm-hmm. parallel arts. I hope you're still maintaining that list. Oh, yes. I mean, we've still had the portable vibrators from before for the, mm. the Time Champions use. Yeah. Uh, but obviously these have, been, these have been used too. It's fascinating. Al seems very, you know, 
when he jumped over to us one earlier on, it mm-hmm. doesn't seem like it was a big deal for him. Does he do this all the time? Does he milk. do it on the fly? Does he go to the shops, there's no milk, does he nip over to Earth One to buy <laughs> might some? Might do, might do, wouldn't mm. you? Yeah, I probably would, to be honest. <laughs> anyway, so yes, so as the caption says, Al reaches for his controls, but he exclaims, Ow! Because the Ray Palmer atom has grabbed a hold of his finger and twisting it back, Al says, Adam, I thought sure I'd knocked you out. Ray replies, It takes more than a love tap like that to get me, chum. Caption for the next panel. Desperately, the larger-sized Atom flings himself toward the garden flagging. Yes, Al hurls himself forward. He's thinking, he's got such a firm grip on my fingers, I can't activate the vibrator. Maybe I can jar it into action by hitting its stud against the flagstones. Goodness me. Mm. Story continued, the third page falling. Pass a couple of toy commercials. We pass an, oh, here's an interesting one. Full page advertisement for issue one of The Secret Six. Excellent. I had a full set of that at one point. Yep. I've got them all as well. I don't have them anymore. Great stuff. So there you go. Did I ever read them? No. Gosh. I know. You never ever found out who Mockingbird was. Was There was a story in Action Comics Weekly, wasn't there? That's that's what revealed who Mockingbird was. (laughs) Without telling the listeners and myself who it was, how did you feel about that reveal? Did you read the story? Uh, Yes, I don't recall. I haven't read it. I haven't read it since the time. (laughs) That's vain. (laughs) I mean, that probably says it all, listeners, doesn't Mm. it? Okay. So then, now to page 17, the caption of the first panel says... As both atoms crash down on the garden walk... Yeah, there's a great trippy spiral effect behind them here. There's obviously something's gone wrong. Al was trying to activate his dimensional vibrator. And Al Pratt says, We're on our way back, Adam, to your Earth and to your sanity. Caption for the next panel. The parallel Earth quivers into nothingness, but as the atomic vibrator snaps a weakened filament, the two tiny titans stop short... On an interdimensional world. Wow, so Captain does a lot of heavy lifting, because indeed we see that the two atoms are now on a very sort of rocky orange landscape mm. with a swirling sort of blue-grey sky behind them. So that's not bad. We're getting a bit of Golden Age, Silver Age team-up and also a bit of a, an interlude in another interdimensional world. That's yeah. not bad. That's not bad for, you know, for your 12 cents mm-hmm. or indeed your free podcast. So, in this panel, the Earth 2 atom looks a little bit more rattled. Earth 1 atom is up an atom, if you pardon the pun. He leaps for Al, saying, This is as far as I go, Adam. When I leave here, it'll be alone. And then the Earth 2 Atom tries to swap him out of the way, saying, When you leave here, it'll be prone. And then with a VAM, Atom of Earth 2 punches the Atom of Earth 1 in almost the reverse of the, the image we get on the cover. Yes. Sending him flying. And Al Atom says, Believe me, Adam, I'm doing this for your own good, even if you're not level-headed enough to realise it. Okay. Top of page 18 now. The caption for the first panel says, Moving with uncanny speed, an alien plant of the eerie between world reaches out to grip and cling. Yes, it's another caption doing a lot of heavy lifting there because we suddenly see that the Ray Palmer atom is sort of all coiled up and twisted amongst the leaves of this strange alien plant. And as he's tangled up, the Earth One atom says, No fair using plant weapons to fight me, <laughs> you overgrown hunk of humanity. And Al Pratt atom thinks, He's so sore at me, he doesn't realise his life's in danger from that plant. Okay, so panel 2 of page 18 shows the index finger of Al Pratt Atom extending towards the open palm of Ray Palmer Atom. Obviously, he's going to try and affect his machinery. Ray Atom says, Hey, fingers off my controls! I'm rescuing you, pal, making you big enough to free yourself from that plant's stranglehold. So, the caption for the next panel. Instantly, the tiny titan shoots up to his six-foot height. Yes, he does, and says, I'm Ray Palmer again. That's mighty big of you, but I'm not letting up on you. So Ray's back at his proper age, sooty and booted, busting free the bits of plant, and Al thinks, I was having such a hard time with him in his six-inch size, maybe I'll do better when he's six feet tall. Okay, the caption for the next panel. Fists like hammers ram home against the young nuclear scientist of Earth-1. Knuckles flail against jaw and midsection, slammed backwards, bent double. Ray has no time to put up a defense against the overpowering onslaught that overwhelms him. Yep, nice Gil Kane style montage of what's just been described taking place, you know, undercuts and bunches the midriff and bursts of force. Ray's taking a bit of a pounding. And then page 19 is a full page splash and it's a cracker. Mm. As a caption panel it says... Irresistibly, Atom 2 drives forward, not giving up his battering advance, cutting Ray Palmer's drooping defence to bits. Then... With a massive quack sound effect, which again is another image which is really the inverse of the front cover. Yeah. Side by side, they look very, very interesting. Mm-hmm. 
Al Pratt punches Ray Palmer, sending him flying. Al is thinking, that'll put him out of commission long enough for me to repair my atomic vibrator and continue our journey back to Earth-1. It's a beautiful panel here. There's a bit of rocky outcrop, a couple of moons in the sky. Safe to say that one's going on Instagram. Yep. Over the page then to page 20. And the caption there for the first panel says, And then, atomic moments later, both men firm into place on Earth-1. Very helpfully, Al Pratt says what's going on. Oh no! You've been de-aged a few more years. Yeah, because Ray looks very young indeed here, actually, in this panel. He was look like looks very much like the the tenth doctor played by David Tennant. It's very funny. And youthful Ray Palmer is saying I don't know what you're talking about, mister. All I know is I've got to hurry over to Mount Ivy where my club, the Scienceers, is meeting. He legs it in the next panel saying We're shooting off a test rocket and I'm in charge. Captain Worth two runs after him thinking. Mentally and physically, he's now about 14 years of age. Got to go after him and make him understand what's happened. Caption for the next panel. As the youthful Ray Palmer races up to Mount Ivy... Well, very helpfully, Ray thinks what he sees and what's going on. Huh? Have that radio telescope get up here. And where are the rest of the science ears? I'll bet some crank chased them away so he could carry out his own experiments. It's a very moody panel. Showing a darkened, sort of scary sky with a giant radio telescope. Very Legopolis. Yes. Panel 4 of page 20 is a caption that says, Snatching up a rock, Teenager Ray attacks the radio telescope with uncontrollable savagery. Gosh, yeah, we see him striking at the base of the telescope, the rock, managing to do a bit of damage. And as he does this, he says, I'll smash it to bits. Make way for our rocket shoots. The other two atoms arrived in the scene and he cries, Ray, stop! He thinks he still hasn't lost his aggressiveness. Caption for the next panel. Suddenly, incredibly, as the radio telescope crumples to the ground... Gee whiz, now they obviously don't make incredibly resilient radio telescopes <laughs> no. on Earth 1, or else Ray was vicious as heck. A 14-year-old with a boulder can yeah, take one down. exactly. <laughs> that, I'm going to start saying that for the rest of my life. A 14-year-old with a boulder could do a better job. That's very interesting. I wonder if there's maybe some USB size and weight controls behind the... I would guess it would have to be. Probably. Yeah. Yes, the caption then is, as we say, the telescope is crumpled to the ground and suddenly Ray seems to be restored back to normal. He's still holding the giant rock and he says, Hey, where are those crooks I'm fighting? How did it get to be Ray Palmer and what am I doing here with this rock? Adam, you here too? Yep, he's noticed his colleague from Earth 2 who says, Ray, you did it. You found the cause of the ageing process. As the next panel shows them standing with the, the wreckage of the legs of the radio telescope in front of them. Atom of Earth 2 stroking his chin with his cape blowing in the wind says, This radio telescope must have been picking up some strange stellar radiation from outer space and broadcasting it into this vicinity. Huh? Sorry, Adam, I'm not running with you. Spread it out for me nice and thin so I can understand. Top page 21, caption for the first panel. With a sigh of relief, Atom 2 quickly fills in Ray Palmer on the details of the past few hours. Yep, so we catch up with the conversation. Nice silhouetted figure of the Earth 2 atom and a suited and booted Ray Palmer of Earth 1 and Ray is saying And I actually fought with you? What a fight, Ray. I'm sorry about that, Adam but obviously I didn't know what he was doing. Forget all that. Now that the age mystery has been solved on this Earth, I can and then they're interrupted by a voice saying Hold up, you two! And then a gentleman who looks very much like the, the Wesley Dodds of the Sandman Mystery Theatre series from the, the early 90s. Kind of brown suit with the specs the red tie is running up the hill towards them, and he's saying, Who smashed my radio telescope? I was picking up some new type radiation from a distant star as it was in the process of being formed. Al Pratt Atom replies, That may explain it. The radiation was some kind of youth frequency. <laughs> like, <laughs> like what, Radio 1 FM? Which for some unknown reason affected only males in this sector of Earth 1, just as females were affected in reverse on my own Earth. Ray Palmer continues in the next panel. Evidently, it struck only in the Pembroke section of Ivy Town because those radiations bounced off the radio telescope, hit the Van Allen radiation belt, and were deflected in that particular sector. Sure, and I wasn't affected here by those frequencies because I was protected by the radiations I absorbed on Earth too. There must be a parallel situation in my world. I've got to vibrate there, turn the clock back for Betty and Marion. Wait, Adam, there may be complications. I'm coming with you. And radio telescope signed his guy in the close-up of the other end of this panel. He thinks, I'm getting out of here before <laughs> their talk drives me stark raving mad. 
Gosh, right, well, caption for the next panel on page 21 says, Moments later, after Ray has reduced himself to Earth-1 atom size, both Mighty Mites appear on Earth-2. Yeah, we're with both atoms and they're gesturing. We can see a radio telescope in the background. Earth-2 atom says, There it is, on Mount Calvin. Things are parallel on the two Earths, but there are differences. The radiation here probably bounced off the Morsey radiation belt, was deflected to Claxon Woods. And then the Earth-1 atom continues. Instead of picking up frequencies from a new star, this telescope gathered in the radiations of a dying one, somehow causing the ageing process only in females. <laughs> Let's smash that thing before it spreads any further trouble. I love how clever they are. These, ma- these yes. massive deductive leaps that they've made. Tiny Titans, mighty intellect. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I love that they haven't felt the need to carry out any tests, <laughs> just to make sure. Who needs tests when you've got radio telescopes to smash? Exactly. So the caption of the final panel on page 21 says, But as the dual atoms race at their targets... Yeah, there seems to be some sort of resisting force pushing them back. Earth 2 Atom says, Ah, the radiation's formed a force field around the telescope. There's no way to reach it. No way for you, but not for me, if I shrink myself down to the size of an atomic bullet. Gosh. Top of page 22, the caption of the first panel says, As Atom 1 becomes all but invisible, his counterpart shoots him into the force field. Yep, panel shows Al flinging Ray forwards, and as he goes flying, Ray Atom thinks, If only I can fly straight through. Caption for the next panel. Inside the force field, the tiny titan is battered by a maelstrom of energy forces. Yep, very trippy looking panel as Atom thinks. This is worse than the buffeting I get when I go into the time pool. Got to increase my size. Make better time. Caption for the next panel. Driven to his knees by the awesome fury of energy gone mad, he crawls, inch by slow inch, across a tiny section of land bombarded by frightful ergs of power seeking (laughs) to annihilate him. Well done. Who wrote this again? Gardner Fox. Thanks for that, Gardner, from 50 (laughs) years later. Yes, this panel shows Ray Atom. Still being bombarded by the energy of the force field crawling across the ground, and he thinks, Almost halfway there, and more than halfway out on my feet. Caption for the next panel. Finally, his hands lift, fasten like clamps to a lever, and. We see Ray grabbing hold of a bit of equipment, still energy crackling all around him, Kirby style actually. And he's operating the lever, and he thinks, <sighs> Turned telescope off. Caption for the next panel. Even as the tiny titan collapses. <laughs> this panel does a lot of lifting, if you burn the bun. In the foreground, we can see the Earth 1 atom unconscious in the grass. And in the background, Al Pratt atom lunges forward, toppling the radio telescope. We don't actually see it, really. We just see him <laughs> pushing one leg and a little bit of concrete foundation over. Oh, yeah. And as he does this, the Earth 2 atom says, Did it! Thanks to double atom teamwork. Over the page, final page of the story, the caption of the first panel says, Later, on Earth 2, after the old women have reverted to their youthful selves... Yeah, we see in the foreground of the panel, Al and Marion smiling away in the background, Betty and Jim. Betty says... Bill, it looks like Al and Marion are hitting it off. Yep, I think they're heading for some some talks, (laughs) really frankly, because Jim must be getting annoyed that his wife can't get his name right. (laughs) Jim, because that's who he was identified first in the story, and we're sticking to it. Jim replies... After that fantastic first meeting, their relationship could only go from bad to better. (laughs) Unlike us, of course. (laughs) That's a little addition. Questions need to be asked in that household. Anyway, so we conclude then with the final panel as a caption that says, And on Earth One... we're back with a smiling and beaming Gene Loring who says, Just think, Ray, if it hadn't been for the Adam, you'd be engaged to a girl you hadn't even dated. Ray replies, Very funny, honey. The, the end. end. I wonder if they were then going to go off to another exhibition of bookends and then another seafood dinner. Hopefully, maybe one in Earth too, using the portable vibrator. Yes. Gosh, well, there we have it. The end. That was issue 36 of The Atom. Yes. Lots of fun to be had there. That was good. It rattled along. It didn't outstay its welcome at all. Remember, kids, if you think science is dangerous, just smash something. That's, <laughs> that's the, the Yes, just there. hit it with a stone. Yes, grab a big boulder and smash some machinery. That's great. Yes, that's that's what you should do. I hope you're listening, Caitlin Higgins. That's an instruction. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what do you think, then? I really enjoyed that. It was 
it was very disposable and daft. Yes. And it felt as if Gardner felt we had to do another Atom team up, but thought, what will we do? Uh, first of all, the previous meeting was quite low key for the Atom team up. So mm. let's do another one that's also quite low key. It affects no one apart from their immediate selves. And their, yeah, their immediate yeah. acquaintances. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting compared to, you know, the Flash, early Flash ones where, you know, Earth was in danger of being destroyed mm. and or the GL ones where there was a lot of cosmic damage in both of us. This, yeah. this was, again, very low-key, almost intimate. Yeah. It felt a lot more disposable than a mm-hmm. lot of stuff we've done recently. Yeah. Maybe because some of the other stories we've done recently have been with new writers and maybe a little bit more depth. Yeah. You know I mean, that, it did feel a bit of a throwback. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have too much to say about it. Again, it's another comic that I've owned for decades and hadn't really read before we did the podcast. Mm-hmm. The Ray being youth and then re-aging again stuff yeah. was actually quite funny. That could have been played a bit more for laughs, I think. True. They could have had a bit more fun with that, like, you know, Ray mm-hmm. turning up at somewhere at his, his, his university and some more of his university colleagues being like, you know, what are you talking about? Yeah. It was interesting that he completely wrote off Marion because she was 50. That was interesting. Let's have a think about that just now because obviously Al's been around since the 40s. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How old is he going to be at this yeah. point? so... Even if he's in his late teens by the time the JSA started, that's yeah, still uh-huh. nearly 30 years. Uh-huh. So he's probably in his mid-40s anyway. Mm. So really... A few years older than you, Al. Uh, yeah, it was, yeah, it's a bit odd. Um, and that's one thing I, I think probably wasn't taken into consideration at all. Mm-hmm. Regarding that, you know, he's um, yeah. Maybe it's the side effect of the Ian Carco radiation that we've not heard about yet. Could be, yes. <laughs> Spoilers uh, for All Star Squadron Annual Issue Three, there, listeners. So I thought it was interesting that Al was single in this story because in his Golden Age stories. He was in a relationship with a woman called Mary James. In fact, she appeared in the very first appearance of the Atom, introducing the mighty Atom from yes. All American 19. It came out on the 20th of August 1940. Yeah. That rings a bell now that you see mm-hmm. it, actually. Yeah. Uh huh. And she actually went all the way appearing regularly through the Atom's features. Right. And her last appearance was in his last solo appearance in uh, Sensation Comics 86. That came out on the 17th of December 1948. Right. In a story called The Undersea Raiders. And an interesting thing about that is at the beginning of that story, it's only a five-page story. Right. Al's supposed to be with Mary, but he kind of leaves her to go off and deal with these crooks. When he comes back in the final panel of the story, she's walking away from him with her head held high saying, Some escort, where did you disappear to? And Al was pleading after her, why don't you give me a chance to explain? So that's the final appearance of her. Now, they'd been a, a solid couple all the way through. Is that a breakup? Is that why he's single at this moment? That's very interesting. So, yeah, there's hardly any mention of it. I mean, she is in lots of yeah, Atom uh-huh. Al stories. Yeah, because now you mention mm-hmm. I remember her. That's fascinating. So like, I wonder then, like, she's never appeared in any modern stories? Well, yeah, she has. That's the thing. Ah, Skipping right, forward, okay, right. she is married to him. In the Whatever Happened to the Golden Age Atom story. So at some point, they've obviously got back together and got married. And of course, they are the parents of the character that we come to know as Damage. Right. Of so, yeah, at some point, all that happens. But at the point in time of this story, Al is obviously single and ready to mingle. So that's quite fascinating. That is interesting. Yeah. You know, were they, did they meet again in the early Middle Age after a long gap and reconcile and think, what about all this time we've wasted? We should just get on with it. Might have done, yeah. And then had a child and stuff. So 1980, 13th of November 1980 is when the Whatever Happened to the Golden right. Age Atom came We're out. We're going to put it, obviously, the, the Whatever Happened to Backup Strips listeners, mm-hmm. they, they appeared in quite a few issues of DC Comics Presents. And our kind of plan for them is when we get this to do you know, three or four of them maybe per episode because they're, they're, they're quite nice little short little stories. Yeah. And, feature a lot of Golden Age characters and a couple of other mm-hmm. people that we've mentioned here and there. That's a really, really interesting point because he, there's not even a mention of, of her and Jim, Stroke, Bill and Betty. They're mm-hmm. obviously quite keen to kind of, mm-hmm. maybe to get Al involved with someone. So maybe, you know, was Mary on and off for a long time and they finally just sorted it out? I don't know. It's, don't that's know. very interesting. Maybe when we write our DC comic. We could cover that, yeah. We could. The reconciliation of. Yeah. Another thing, again, flashing forward, uh, I thought it was quite fun to see Ray de-aged, considering he's de-aged much later on and becomes a member of the Teen Titans. Of course, yeah, that That's takes place in, in Zero Hour, which yes. is obviously, you know, um, a few years after our remit will end. Mm-hmm. He was youth for a while in the, mm-hmm. the mid-90s, because I remember there's a couple of years Superman that he popped up in yeah. and stuff, because mm-hmm. he had a slightly different costume. It, it, there was an interesting thing, because his size powers kind of varied slightly, because yeah. he almost seemed to echo Colossal Boy, because he wore that red and blue traditional uniform, yes. which... The, the head part of it, the mask, was was showing his hair. so his flowing was, locks. Yeah, there was points when he would grow to large size and look very much like Colossal Boy from Legion, which was interesting because at that point in the Legion continuity, the reboot after Zero Hour, Leviathan was killed off quite early on. Hmm. And I remember, now that you mention all this, I remember thinking that there might be a, 
when it was because I, I really enjoyed the Dan Jorgens Titan series at yeah. the time. Yes, I must say it does not it hasn't aged very well at all. Mm-hmm. And I remember sort of thinking when they had youthed them, giving them this slightly different looking costume. Yeah. I thought were they setting it up that he was going to go to the you know the future and join well, the Legion yeah. as Colossal Boy? Would there have been a crossover? I don't know if it ever occurred to anyone. It never happened, sadly. Mm-hmm. But I remember being convinced that that's what they were going towards. Yeah, that'd have been cool. You know, yeah. it didn't mm-hmm. happen, of course. Sadly, as I keep saying, I wonder if that was in Dan Jorgens' mind. The story was May in Dan Jorgen's mind when they, they did that to him in Zero Hour. May well have been, who knows? Interesting. One thing I just liked about it was it's very much an Al Pratt story in a way because it yeah, starts uh-huh. off with him, he's in costume for mm-hmm. the most, he takes a divisive sort of strike at the end to knock down the other radio telescopes. It was quite nice that he's he's got a bit of a focus because we don't see too much of him. No. He's in the JLA JSC team up that features everyone that, is, that shares a name. Yeah. But he's pretty much benched for the 70s because he, be, I don't think he features in the revived All Star comics at all. But then, you know, he gets a, a lot more to do at the start of All Star Squadron, which mm-hmm. readdresses the balance a little bit. And of course, when the JSA are rescued from Limbo in 1992 in Armageddon Inferno, he's a bit more of a crusty, yes. funny character yeah, in the Justice Society yeah. series that mm-hmm. followed. So, um, yeah, I like how. You know, we mentioned Zero Hour already, you know, that, that bloody Zero Hour mm-hmm. you know, that took our man and Doctor Midnight and the Atom off the yep. off the table. And our man got rescued about 10 years later, but, you know, Chuck and Al, nah, never forgive, never forget. Oh, well. Anyway. On a lighter note, do you not think it's hilarious that people are panicking so much on Earth too, that the women are getting older, that they have to phone in the police <laughs> <laughs> and report it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that is odd, because, you yeah. know, imagine that happened in real life. I wonder if they asked him then, did he go back to the police and say, look, you know, everyone mm-hmm. should re-age back to the normal. I've just destroyed this satellite <laughs> thingy, this radio telescope. Yeah. Aye, there's always, I mean, it's weird. We talked about how some of the, the, the see what you see captions that maybe do, that do a lot of the heavy lifting, but then there's an awful lot of stuff that's left unseen and unresolved. Mm-hmm. And some... I hope the scientists that put up these radio telescopes are recompensed. Yes, me too. I hope they're <laughs> insured against superhero criminal damage. Or teenagers with boulders. Yes. Yeah. Teenagers with boulders supported menswear at the Lomax in Liverpool in 1996. <laughs> right. One final thought I'd like to add is the fact that nothing seems to have changed over the last 10 years for Ray Palmer and Gene Loring. They're both staying in the same places. Right. Ray went back to his own house. Of course. Uh, and when he went to pick up Gene, she's obviously staying in the same house. And also, Gene doesn't seem to have aged over the 10 years that Ray had lost, or else he would have commented on it. So. <laughs> yeah, he probably would have noticed, wait a minute, Gene looks 10 years older or something. <laughs> I did think that when I was reading it, actually. It's a bit odd that he didn't remark on it. Maybe it was the curlers that threw him off. Yeah, probably very <laughs> distracting. Anyway, so we'll skip ahead a couple of issues now to issue 38 in the letter column Inside the Atom. Gosh. Indeed. And the first letter goes something like this. Dear Editor, well, Gardner Fox has done it again. Done what? Taken an old, used story plot and developed it into an interesting and well-written tale. I've seen the plot dozens of times before. Some strange radiation (laughs) ages people in embarrassing moments. The difference that Mr. Fox introduced in Duel Between the Duel Atoms that really made this story is that the ageing, or de-ageing, brought the person into a certain moment in his life. That's very true. Mm -hmm. That is interesting, yeah. I really got a kick out of that de-aged crook on page 9 who didn't want to miss a TV episode of Maverick. All right. But for some reason, this wasn't done to the women on Earth 2 who aged. And I'm wondering why not. All that would have been necessary is for Mr. Fox to conjecture on what thoughts a woman 50 years old would have. The story wouldn't have run the same. I disagree because obviously they haven't been 50. They're aging up. They're not flashing back to a previous time. Yeah, that's very true. We didn't really pick up too much on the bad guys having that sort of, Mm -hmm. how did I get out of prison? That They had the sort of memory dislocation sort of thing as well. So presumably did they revert back? They didn't look that much visibly younger. I suppose now that I look (laughs) back on it, Baldy actually has a little bit more hair coming in between the first panel on page nine and then the third panel. Mm -hmm. And the other guys, I suppose, do look a little bit younger, but it's not, yeah, I mean, the guy in the blue suit, especially when you look back on it, but it's not terribly clear. It's not flagged up. It's not like there's a caption. Yeah, it's not as clear cut as Ray's de aging. Yeah. yeah, in fact, I'm, I don't think I picked up on that at all mm-hmm. when, I, when we were reading it. That's so I'm glad that letters <laughs> that letters there. There we are. Gosh, the letter writer continues. However, that bit on page eleven where Ray thought Jean Loring was a fast worker made up for this. And if the minds of the women of Earth Two had been affected, then perhaps there would not have been room in the story for this incident, and that would have been criminal. One place I feel the story falls down is when Atom One attacks Atom Two. The reason for this seems slightly contrived, as there is no special reason why forward backward ageing should have affected him this way. It seems thrown in there so that there would be some action in the tale. 
Otherwise, there was virtually none, the Atoms vs Crooks scenes not being particularly exciting. But somehow, contrived or not, I'm glad this battle was put in. It certainly added to the tale. Special congratulations for the artful pages of colourful double atom action and the explosive cover! I don't believe there's ever been a cover where one hero was knocking another right through it. And that's from Jim Vicko, Scarborough, Ontario. Editorial response to that one is, you object to certain story contrivances, then obligingly overrule your own objections. So what's your verdict? Are we innocently guilty? Editor, there's some really good points there, actually. Mm-hmm. I mean, take away the, the fights, and there's not really too much. Yeah, They could have cut all the fights between Ray and Al down a little bit, and it could have been a 14-page story quite easily. True. I'm just annoyed that we didn't really pick up on the guy obviously talking about Maverick and all yeah. that, that. That We didn't really pick up that that was a symptom of them having been youthed. Yeah. I guess maybe Maverick had been cancelled by 1968. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, okay, so that's maybe, I suppose, a failure. We didn't quite grasp that. Mm-hmm. So the next letter then... You should start this in the style of Nothing Compares to You by Sinead O'Connor. <laughs> I see you did there. It's been seven issues and 14 months. Since the first guest appearance of Al, the original Atom Pratt, in the Mighty Mites magazine, we nostalgic readers always welcome a well-timed visit from a member of your Golden Age stable. Once again, the peerless Gardner Fox has given us a plot which not only finds another crisis in Earth 1 and 2, forgive me for stealing your JLA stuff, but as the bigger Atom playing the major role. Only proves that even the world's smallest superhero is sometimes susceptible to dangerous causes and effects. His age recession and mental disturbance as both the Atom and Ray Palmer gave him a human quality that we sometimes overlook or refuse to accept. Hmm. After all, he's basically a being whose only powers are the ability to shrink in size and maintain the weight advantage on his normal body. Those are quite cool, to be honest. Yes. Uh-huh. Only. This does not make him invulnerable. On the other hand, Al Pratt, who does not have the advantage of changing his size and relies only on extra strength, did display a quality not often attributed to him in the early days. That is a calmness blended with some keen thinking that ultimately allowed good teamwork to find the cause of the ageing on both planets and eliminate same. And that's from Jeffrey B. Siegel, the Bronx, New York. That's true, because I was a bit of a headstrong mm-hmm. lad when he yeah, was younger. Definitely. You know, that whole, I suppose, small man syndrome of having to be a bit bigger and tougher. That's, mm-hmm. that's, a, that's a good point. I wonder if there's any relation to any other Seagulls. Okay, the next letter then. Dear Editor, Characterization was well done in the May Atom. Al Pratt's failure with the fair sex, whether or not because of his stature, is a welcome departure from the usual type of superhero and or his alter ego. In most mags, the hero has a bevy of beauteous females following him around, which tends to invoke extreme feelings of self-pity in the average male reader, and thereby lowers the appeal of the hero. Up until this time, I had not thought too much of the other Atom, but Pratt impresses me as a very realistic and likeable fellow. Bessie Roberts is the epitome of the average American married woman. Kind, friendly, but nonetheless a busybody who hates to see a single man remain that way. Even Ray Palmer was allotted an abundance of humanity insofar as he was a typical college freshman out on his first date with a girl. And that's from Black Lightning, Jefferson Pierce from Stanford, California. Yeah, good to hear from you, Jeff. It's been a while. I think it's a very, very dated concept. No, but it's, that's what I was going to say. It's, <laughs> it's a fair assessment of probably what a lot of people thought at the time. And it just yeah. shows, I suppose, like like many other things, how far things have improved. Mm-hmm. We've talked endlessly about the bad attitudes and sort of displays of the way that some of the female characters have been written, you know, like in the Lois Lane stories and stuff. And yeah. The way Wonder Woman was treated. And oh, yes in Wonder Woman 175 recently. It's interesting, just from a social history point of view, I suppose, True. observing what these attitudes were. Mm-hmm. Okay, the next letter. Dear Editor, the May Atom was typically good, and I was more than delighted to see the Atom of Earth 2 back in action. The first Atom Atom team-up was nothing compared to this story. I think I preferred the first one. To... Anyway, hmm. which one did you prefer? The first one did have the bookends. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you've got vintage bookends, yeah. it is a big selling point. Also, The Thinker, which obviously is fantastic. I think Gil Kane was a little bit more Gil Kane in the first one as well. Yeah. So it's a bit more interesting. And the first one had a proper villain, yeah, you know, which it was, is great. Yeah, I, this certainly felt a little more disposable. Mm-hmm. Okay, the letter continues. The Golden Age Atom was at his best. His brilliant costume added much to his effectiveness as he darted in and out of free for all, somehow lighter in his feet than he has ever been before. The scenes wherein he battled Ray Palmer were the best in the comic. Just goes to prove that a gimmick superhero, little Atom, without his gimmick, small size, is no match for a superhero, big Atom, inured to fighting crime with no paranormal skills at all. Besides all this, smaller touches helped the plot along. The in-between world that the two Atoms materialised on was a stroke of genius. Yes, I did like that bit. Heretofore, your hero's dimension travelled with as much ease as they would cross the street. I was glad to notice the bit of difficulty involved. Furthermore, the differences between the two Earths 
so well brought out in the Moresby radiation belt and the topographical changes, Ivy Town, Calvin City, added to the general interest. Yeah, that's fair. That was that was good. Mm -hmm. Do me a favour, dear editor. Keep the atom the way it is. Don't change a thing in the magazine, namely art, writing and editing in favour of some new look. The present atom is the best. And that's from Rand Lee. Yes, Roxbury, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So, yes, Peter, sharp and take a breath there. The editorial response to that letter is... The present atom you refer to is now the past atom. More about this in the commentary on the next letter, says the yes. editor. So, the next letter. Dear editor, hmm... So Ray Atom Palmer was a member of the Scienceers when he was younger? That's odd. Where have I heard that name before? Seems to me I know someone who used to belong to a club of that name in his earlier days too. Oh well. The May Atom was a distinct improvement over the previous dual Atom tale, which isn't saying much. Oh dear. The art was unusual for the Atom. It was bad. I think an artistic change for the Atom is mandatory. Hmm. Scienceers. Who do I know that belonged to it? I won't say a great deal about the Fox script. It was a pleasant surprise to see the two atoms battling no almighty supervillain. Scienceers. Scienceers. Who belonged to anyway? Well, that's my five. Make that six cents worth. If I could only remember the name of that guy who belonged to the Scienceers. Jules Black or something like that. And that's from future comic writer Mark Ivanier from Los Angeles, California. I've always been a big fan of Mark. I used to enjoy his text pieces and whenever he talked about working with Sergio Argonez, but I'm not liking the way he comes across in any of these letters <laughs> at all. Well, Sorry, Mark, if you're listening. I hope you cringe at your former self. Okay, so the response to Mark's letter is, with the sudden departure of Gil Kane for other fields of endeavour, the artistic change did indeed become mandatory, so it's Robbins to Sikowski to Roussos for this atom to be followed by another all-new lineup for the next issue, Bob Kaniger and Murphy Anderson. Canagher. Yes, Shakes Fist, in which the Atom and Hawkman magazines are merged into one. Gasp. We assure you, it'll be a wonderful issue. That's one emphasised with O-N-E there. As for the name of that Science Ears youngster you wouldn't recall, we asked our fellow editor, Mort Weisinger, a charter member of the Science Ears, for his name, and he advised us it was Julius Schwartz. Now, where did we and you hear that name before? Editor. I don't know what the Science Ears are, to be honest. If you know what they are, Wait and tell us, listeners. So that's the end of the letters page there. So obviously we have a plan to do a couple of issues of the Atom and Hawkman for too long, but we're not going to tell you which one, see if mm. you can guess. So yes, exciting letters there. And if you want to write to us with an exciting letter, you can. We're at theearth2podcast at gmail.com. Make sure you follow us on social media, on Facebook and Instagram, we're at the Earth 2 Podcast, And on Twitter, we're at podcast underscore earth2. Also make sure you check out our website, that's theearth2podcast.com, where you can find this and all our other episodes. Yep, check out the socials. A few other bits and bobs already arranged. A couple of things actually I've had on my phone for over a year <laughs> for this episode. So yeah, look out for that. Check out our website, the 2 podcastcom And if you're feeling generous, you can go to our coffee page and buy the coffee. On that note, I've been Peter. And I've been David. And we'll see you next time on... The Earth, Earth 2, 2 Podcast. Podcast. Transmatter cube activated. Return coordinate set for Earth Prime. Uber dynamic as Al Pratt in his bright yellow and blue sort of goes flying forward at the front. A massive punch sort of sound effect for where Ray has co collected or connected. I should try that again. Massive big burst of force where Ray Palmer's collected. Did it again? Yeah, a massive big burst of force where Ray Palmer. <laughs> La da -dee, da da do. A massive big burst of force where um Ray Palmer has connected with Al. <laughs>